welcome to Inside Leather History, a fireside chat. I'm Doug O'Keefe. I am the host and the producer of the chats, which are a program of the Leather Archives and Museum. Today, I'm at Leatherworks in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, with Bear Man. Bear Man is the founding partner of Leatherworks here. How are you today? I am well. Thank you for hosting us here at Leatherworks. Pleasure to have you. So, tell us a little bit about business. How's it going post-pandemic or middle pandemic, however? Well, with the with the exception of things like the Red Hanky Social and the Bondage Club and the social events we do here, uh, things are going quite well this year. Okay. Uh, in of course, 2020 was a disaster. Uh, and mid-year 2021, things picked up, and we had a great year. And 2022 is off to a good start, even though we didn't get to go to Mid-Atlantic Weather. Well, there's always next year, we'll hope. Let's go all the way back. Tell us a little bit about where you're from, a little bit about your family, your background. Well, I was born in Northeast Ohio, and I was raised there and here in Orlando, uh, and in upstate New York. I moved to Florida after a breakup with a boyfriend in uh, 96, 95, something like that. Uh, I came down for season. Okay. Uh, it was October when we broke up and I came to Florida for season and season isn't over because I'm still here. I haven't <laughs> gone away. You actually attended Divinity School. Tell us a little bit about that. Too. Yes, uh, I attended Duke Divinity School for two and a half years. I uh, withdrew when my partner at the time, this was in the uh, early 90s, uh, late 80s actually, uh, when HIV was uh, new and there were no medications for it, and my partner got sick and I could not take care of him, work, and keep up with school. So that's the uh, uh, that's the long and the short of divinity school. Uh, I'm still a very uh, I still recognize the importance of uh, community in our lives, um, and that's. How I tend to I tend to see religion as a group of stories that help us guide our lives and help us create a community that we participate in, and I've just changed communities. Okay, that's a very sort of progressive point of view on that. I think. How does that fit in with whatever you were taught in school? It depends on where you go to school. Okay. Uh, and my degree, my original degree uh, is in philosophy. And we, and my thing through school was what was called at the time narrative theology. How stories inform our lives. And uh, it's the it's the cultural canon that we belong to, uh, the stories, the art uh, that create our life, the people we um, associate with. And, and that's how I see the leather community, is it's a series. We have a problem in the leather community in the last decade with our cultural canon breaking down. Uh, when I was a, a young one, uh, Every Leatherman I know read Drummer Magazine the day it came out. And if you didn't subscribe, you knew which day of the month it would show up at your local newsstand, and you were there to get it. And there were, you know, at the time, uh, there was Bear Magazine, and American Bear Magazine, and International Leatherman, and a couple more. And we all read those from cover to cover. So we saw the same stories, we saw the same art, um, and it created our cultural canon. But in the uh, 
2020, Zeus. Not much left of a uh, of anything to cement the cultural canon. That's a very strong statement. What do you think we're lacking? We're we're lacking a a source of uh, um, community communal stories. We don't all read the same stories. We don't all read the same, we don't all see, see the same art. Um, we, so that part of the cultural canon is very open to interpretation. And without a base that is uniform, it's really hard to develop a cultural canon. How do you feel that could be achieved given the certain circumstances today? Not a clue. Okay. Uh, Leatherworks tries to do some of that with our educational programs, um, but you know, it's just not the same as being one of a hundred thousand men reading the same articles every month and seeing the same cartoons and the same fresh drawings from the Hun or the same fresh drawings from um, Etienne or Tom of Finland, although we didn't see many fresh Tom of Finlands uh, in, in my day, but we saw Tom of Finlands. We, you know, we occasionally see them today, but it's just not the same. Let's build on that a little bit because in the community we so often hear about the lack of enthusiasm and the lack of growth and the lack of support for a lot of institutions, the bars, the groups. Do you think that these two are conjoined? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, you know, the with without a firm basis that everyone agrees on. It's hard to create a community. And so our community, it's not one community, but many communities that are fragmented. Um, you know, we have a community called Recon, and a, a community called Growler, a community called Scruff. Um, but at one time, there were four leather bars functioning in Fort Lauderdale at the same time. Uh, at one time, there were five or six leather shops in Fort Lauderdale at the same time. Uh, today, there's one leather shop and, well, maybe two. A leather shop and a small bar store uh, and two bars. Um, and if it weren't for tourists, we wouldn't have much, much, we wouldn't be able to support two, two bars. Yeah. We see that all over though, don't we? Yes, absolutely. I mean, it, there's a desire for, for guys to get together. I mean, um, Mid-Atlantic Mid Leather and IML and Folsom Street Fair and Up Your Alley. Those are all uh, with us every day, or you know, most years. Um, and they're an opportunity for guys to get together and swap stories and DNA. Uh, and it's the uh, it's the swapping of DNA that's the reason to get together. And while we're doing that, we got to tell stories and tell lies to each other. And, uh, and we see the same art at those events. We see the same clothing. Uh, so we those provide the little bit of cultural stability we have. Now, I can't help but wonder, here at Leatherworks, you must see a very wide breadth of people that come through. Do you feel that there is a strong sense of fellowship there, or do you feel it's rather disjointed like you maybe depicted a moment ago? Oh, I think it's, I think it's, it's, it's very disjointed. Um, we have a fair number of tourists that come through, and so they're just flips, um, and then we have the locals 
but that local community involves people from um, people in their 80s to people in their 20s, and the 20 year old, the 20 somethings, and the 80 somethings don't have a lot in common. Um, there's a few, there's a few of the young ones who like the older men, a few of the older men who like the young ones, but you know, there's not a lot there. Uh, and you know, we used to have five or six leather clubs in town that were reasonably active. And today, we have a puppy club that's not very active. We have a boys club that's not very active. And we have a traditional leather club that's not very active. Um, so there's not a lot of energy. I mean, um, the way I saw it, one of the, one of the things that made the leather clubs uh, function was uh, the desire to get together with like-minded individuals um, and an excuse to uh, travel together and go meet fresh meat. Well, in a community like Fort Lauderdale, the fresh meat arrives at the airport seven days a week, all year long. Mostly, the biggest share is in, in the winter time, but you know it's fresh meat all year long. So, do you feel that that is what is keeping the vibe going here? Without that, do you feel it would sort of evaporate? It would be much smaller. It would be much smaller without without the the tourist influx. Okay. And the fact that there is a community here uh, stimulates tourism. Sure. I mean, guys choose to come to Fort Lauderdale. Leather leather folk choose to come to Fort Lauderdale because there's a leather community here, and there's a couple of guest houses that um, cater to, to uh, leather folk and. There are two two bars and a whole bunch of restaurants. It's a great community. I hear people speak very well of the community here, and especially of a lot of the groups that you host here, a lot of events that you'll host here. But what I'm also hearing is that you're depicting something that's a little disjointed. So what have you to say to people that speak so well? I just got through saying it's a wonderful community. Okay. Okay. It is a wonderful community. Uh, if I think back to the early seventies, um, I went to to uh, college in a small town, and we had a gay bar about thirty five or forty miles away. Um, and that one gay bar was the only the only thing in a hundred miles, uh, and so everybody went there. Uh, uh, the young guys, the old guys, the 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 drag queens, the leather folk, uh, the 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 lipstick lesbians, and the uh, what at the time we called the bull dykes. We all frequented the same place because it was a small town and we had no choice. Mm. And Fort Lauderdale is a big town. And there's a lot of choice. And so, it's, and since there's the opportunity to hang with like-minded individuals, people hang with like-minded individuals. You know, there was a joke from my days in the clergy. You have one Baptist, you have a, Christ, a Christian, you have two Baptists, you have a church, and you have three Baptists, and you have a schism. Uh, you know, when, when a community gets big enough to, to divide into smaller, functional groups, they do. Because we can't maintain intimate relationships with 100 people. We can't maintain intimate relationships with 50. Yeah. Um, and even in a group of 
20 or 25 people. There will be subgroups. Um, so we're because you can't you can't hang and have intimate relationships with a large number of people. It doesn't work. Let's take a step back. Tell us a little bit about your coming out and what circumstances you faced at that time. Uh, I was lucky. I was in Rochester, New York, uh, which at the time, in the early 70s, was a great place um, to come out. We had, I think, five bars and two bathhouses. And you know, the five bars illustrate what I was talking about in the community that divides up because there was a, a bar for the older crowd and there was a leather bar and there was a disco bar and there was a, a neighborhood bar um, and a piano bar. And so the community divided up into the, the places that were comfortable for them. Yes. Um, and you know, I left there to go to college, and in college we had one bar. I just described a few minutes ago. Yes. So it just illustrates the point that I'm talking about, that we find a comfortable place for us. How did you discover King Leather? Oh, uh, I think... Uh, 1963, Cowboys and Indians, and subjugating and tying up, and it it never really changed. It kind of calmed down for a few years as I moved into early adolescence, but by the time I was in my, uh, uh, by the time I was 20, I was back at it again. So, depict the scene a little bit for us at that time. Well, I depicted the scene in a small town where everybody hung together, and we were pretty closeted outside of that one place. Um, and in Rochester, where I grew up, again, it was moderately closeted. It was private. Uh, but Kodak was a big employer at the time and was very open to... They had a lot of gay people working there and you know, they were called Kodak queers. <laughs> uh, and, um, and Xerox was a big employer that brought people in from all over. Um, and it was a rapidly growing community. And it was a it was a comfortable place um, to be discreetly gay, as it were. Um, I came out uh, the summer after my senior year, uh, before I went to college. Uh, came out to uh, my family, um, and you know, as with many, my father. Um, my parents were separated and in the process of divorce at the time. And my father wanted me to come home at night. Uh, so if I had a trick, he wanted me to bring the trick home so he knew where I was. Oh. Uh, whereas my mother didn't want to have much of anything to do with it. She didn't want to know about my boyfriends. She didn't want to hear about it. She didn't want to meet them, participate, nothing. Um, and it was... There were 30 years where my mother and I seldom spoke, uh, whereas my father and I remained close um, all the way through up until his death. Uh, and about, about 15 years ago, uh, my brother managed to get my mother and I to reconcile, um, and we became fairly close uh, in her final years. Um, and I was able to uh, 
spent a lot of time with him the last couple of years of her life. Uh, she That's had, beautiful. She had dementia. Uh, it was painful at times. She didn't always know who I was. Um, it was interesting. There was a boy in our household. She always knew his name. She didn't know my partner Christian's name. She didn't always know who I was. Um, but she always knew Matt's name. It's rather interesting. The, the clouds, they're so difficult to understand. That was a very progressive point of view for your father. How did that happen? I think my father um, was fairly... He went, to a ch he went to church as a kid, and that love thy neighbor kind of stuff kind of rubbed off on him. Um, he was very progressive when it came to education. Um, he knew that the secret to um, ending a lot of the civil strife in our society was education, uh, and was always supporting education for everyone. Um, he grew up in an integrated school, in an integrated neighborhood in the 40s. Okay. Um, so um, he was fairly progressive. And in his later, in his retirement years, he was, he worked with uh, abused children. Wow. He volunteered with abuse, with abused children uh, and was a guardian ad litem in the courts here in Florida. Wow. So, I mean, my, my public service uh, community stuff comes to me naturally. It came from my father. My mother was very bigoted. Um, but she knew she shouldn't be. Um, she very, very narrow-minded in many, many ways. Very, very um, traditional. Um, but she knew it was wrong. Oh, interesting. Um, and so she, while she had all kinds of racial and ethnic. Um, bigotry. She tried not to teach it to her children because she knew what was wrong. That's very progressive for that generation. Yeah. Yeah. A lot changed for you, though, at one point. You had some health issues in your 30s. Tell us about that. Well, I mentioned my partner who got sick while I was in divinity school. Um, after he died, I did not take good care of myself. I didn't know what to do. Um, and so I worked. And I didn't eat well. And I was working 18 hours a day and commuting for an hour a day and living on five hours of sleep, four hours of sleep. Um, and it was uh, a recipe for disaster, and my cooking worked. I had a heart attack at 36, uh, and I went to the doctor the day of the heart attack because something wasn't right. Uh, and because I was 36, the idea of being a heart attack just didn't enter anybody's mind. My gosh. Um, I couldn't see my regular doctor that day. I had to go to urgent care. Totally missed it. Um, and about three months later, I started having angina, and I went to my medical doctor. And he wanted to call an ambulance and haul me to the hospital right then and there. Um, um, and it turned out it wasn't serious, as it were, um, when we got to the point of doing the angioplasty and all that stuff. Um, the artery that was blocked was too small to even put a balloon into at that time. 
uh, but it was enough to create some symptoms. And so with medication and diet and uh, over the years, I've managed to, to control it. Uh, I've had a couple of stents since then. Uh, so my heart isn't the best thing in the world, but uh, it doesn't cause me, it doesn't cause me a lot of problems. I have health issues, but they're all under control. I started my morning this morning with a 30-minute bike ride. I go to the gym three days a week. I ride my bicycle almost every single day. We had a couple of days in the 40s here last week. I heard. I couldn't bring myself to ride my bicycle in the 40s. <laughs> that was a couple of days I missed. But other than that, most days. A lot changed for you, though. With that. You went different directions. What did you do? Well, that's when I finally um, dealt with uh, the loss of my partner. Um, interesting story. I'm full of stories. Um, my, my partner had been, what was his name? Todd. Okay. Todd. Todd. Todd had been dead a little bit over a year. He died just before Thanksgiving. And a year later, I went to Mid-Atlantic Leather. Uh, I couldn't afford it. Uh, I stayed with a friend who lived near, near DuPont Circle. Um, and, um, and, you know, after Todd died, I knew that I would be single the rest of my life because no one would ever love me the way Todd did. And, and I was old, and I was overweight. I was a fat old man. No one was ever going to love me again. Um, and then I went to Mid-Atlantic Leather. Um, and I, there was a lot of evidence that I was wrong about being a fat old man that no one would ever love. Um, the guy I was staying with, had a newsprint picture drawing on the refrigerator of a pig. And he started putting hash marks on it. Oh boy. Uh, and when I, and I didn't even really notice because I was rather busy. Uh, and when I went to leave on Monday, he gave it to me. And I was kind of dense and then he pointed out the hash marks and I said, yep, Got them all. Uh, I, mean, I left his house to go to this DuPont Cir Circle subway station once and never made it to the subway station. Um, that was back when the leather rack was on Connecticut Avenue between his house and DuPont Circle subway station. And I stopped in the leather rack. And what I went shopping for and what I took home were two different things. Oh, my goodness. Um, and... So I was very busy that weekend, and I went home with this tangible proof that I was wrong, that I was not a fat old man that no one would ever love again. Um, and over the next uh, couple of years, I was able to really process that and understand. Um, and I was single for about five or six years. But I turn, turned my, I got to understand myself and unlearn some things that I had learned and taught myself and became um, quite proud and out about being um, a leatherman. Why did Atlantic Leather? Why did you go there? It was close. And my friend lived nearby so I could stay with him for free. How did you learn about it? Uh, remember, everyone read the same magazines and the same uh, stories, and there was the leather journal that had the calendar, and drummer that had the stories. We had this cultural canon, and Mid-Atlantic Leather was a piece of the cultural canon. Got it. Then and now. What happened after that? Uh, 
that's about when um, the Bear Man started as a business. After a couple years after that first trip to Mid Atlantic Leather, uh, the Bear Man started as a business, and then I was an itinerant leather vendor, sell selling um, bear stuff and leather. And went to runs all over the East Coast. And set up my little traveling store for the weekend. Um, and then I moved to Florida and had the opportunity to um, be a partner in the leather shop at the Ramrod. And we did that and realized that, hey, wow, this is successful, but we're 100% dependent on the bar and we need stability. So we found this building that we're in today, and we rented it. Um, and after a year and a half in this building, uh, I realized that uh, this was going to be successful too. And I went to the landlord and uh, offered him, the lease was still active, and I offered him a significant increase in the rent in order for a longer lease. And it worked out well. And eventually, I tried to buy it and tried to buy the building he wouldn't sell. So we moved out of here around the corner onto into just a little store on, on the next street over. And he called me back about 18 months later and said, do you still want to buy that building? It had been nothing but an albatross for him. And we bought the building and did some renovations and have slowly grown into it. Um, and grown out of it now. Um, we've had to move our production into another another building about wow. a block away, and our office is in the building next door. My gosh. Um, okay. So, but let's take a step back because when we prepared for this interview, you told me a little bit more about your your traveling uh, shop. It was very fascinating. How did you do that? Because you had like. Uh, Special little van that you drove. Oh yeah, well, it place. wasn't a special van. Yeah. It was a it was a Chrysler minivan. Okay. Um, Chrysler? <laughs> no, it was a Plymouth. It was back when there was still Plymouths. Uh, it was Plymouth Voyager. Okay. And um, so I would fill it up and plan a, a trip of visiting two or three towns on two or three different weekends. Uh, consecutive weekends in the same neighborhood, um, by the same neighborhood within four or five hundred miles of each other. And during the week, uh, between events, I would stay with friends, maybe friends with benefits maybe. That's uh, always good. Yes, and, um, and I would sell my wares to little gay retail stores. But what prompted you to do this, to, to go on the road and do this? Well, I couldn't afford to go to these leather events. And so I decided to turn them into Busman's Holidays. So I set, created this little business uh, so I could go to an event and sell stuff and make enough money to pay for me to go to the events. Got it. Uh, I didn't make a very good living at it. But the business slowly grew, and I developed inventory and connections, and then when the opportunity to settle down into a, uh, a retail space at the Ramrod Bar, I was all over it. What sort of products did you develop? Oh, you know, the standard kind of stuff, you know. I figured out how to make a ball stretcher, and I figured out vests and harnesses. And for years and years, um, we never had completed harnesses. I just had boxes of parts, and someone would walk in the store or or the traveling store, and I would say, well, you know, we could make a harness for you, uh, and you reach in the box of parts, and get leather straps and some hardware and boom, 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 you made a custom harness for that person. Um, and it was only after I quit working in the store all the time myself that we started making stock harnesses to put on the wall. Um, we 
you just you know would assemble pieces. So, so so our harnesses were sort of like Model T Fords. You know, you just grab the pieces off the shelf. Assembly line. Assembly line. You know, assembly line the pieces, and then assemble them for the for the particular person. And at that time, we made a checkbook cover that had a little leather, leather embroidered leather flag in it, and one that had a rainbow flag in it. Of course, a couple of years ago, I still had some left. You know, finally, ended up giving them away because who has a checkbook anymore? Oh, sure. You know, sure. Um, we made a little bar yeah. wallet that uh, held a driver's license uh, and a a credit card or an ATM card and a couple of dollars. Um, those were popular. Um, and, you know, and then the the, the, the the connections for things like like lube and maybe maybe some little brown bottles. And, you know, it takes a while to find these connections. And we, we did it and we got there. How did people respond to the products you had what sold, what didn't sell, what did you learn from, what they wanted? Well, the biggest thing I learned about merchandise was guys love t-shirts. And leather guys love black t-shirts. And they like suggestive t-shirts. They don't like shirts that are too graphic. They want shirts with a double entendre, or just a suggestion that somebody in the know would recognize. One of my one of my favorite shirts for years was Michael Schrender Schrender Schroeder Schrender something like that. Um, an artist his artist name was Daddy D A D E with it. Oh, okay. uh, and it was. A big bear, hairy bear guy walking a bear on a leash. Mm. That was really, really popular. Um, because if you were in the know, you knew it. Uh, and if you weren't, it's just an interesting image on a shirt. A guy walking a bear on a leash. Um, but uh, a, shirt with a, a shirt with a cock on it, not so much. Mm. And that shirt with the bear on it, we did it with black ink on a white shirt and white ink on a black shirt and the white ink on a black shirt sold probably five to one. Wow. Uh, guys. And in fact, just the other day, in 1993, is when the Bear Man started. And I know that because I just found a box of t-shirts I made in 1993, um, that had uh, my Bearman logo on it, okay. and the date, 1993. Another thing I learned about t-shirts, don't date them. Huh. And that, I printed that shirt in white and in black. Um, and the white shirts I still had, a bunch of. Wow. And the black ones, not a one left. And I kept I kept some of the white ones, and I gave the rest of them away. The weren't my size, uh, and I kept a couple of my size and gave the rest of them all away recently. Um, and it's kind of fun wearing a a, um, a shirt. And from 1993, it had an upside down pink triangle on it. Oh, well, you haven't seen an upside down pink triangle in a decade or two. Um, that was so replaced by the rainbow. Yeah. yeah. So, it, so it was, it's interesting, the changes. But still today here at Leatherworks, we sell very, very few light-colored T-shirts. We sell black T-shirts. For how long were you traveling around doing this? I did that for two years. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, like I said, long enough to get to know people all over the country and meet people at events so that I could put them in my uh, Rolodex <laughs> and, and uh, contact them when I was going to be traveling in, in their part of the world to, for a free place to stay. Okay. Um, and 
and that reminds me of another story. Okay. At, at the time, I had an answering machine hooked up to the hardwired phone at my house. Yes. I didn't have a cell phone. Um, and this is a story of just how small the leather community was. I was living in Durham, North Carolina at the time, and I was going camping with the Bergenfield Bears at Hillside Campground that weekend. And on the way, I needed to go to Passaic, New Jersey for some business. Bright idea. Thursday night, I will drive to Washington and go to the Eagle and see if I can't find a free place to spend the night. Okay. Friday morning, I would get up, go to Passaic, do my business, and then drive to Hillside, spend the weekend with the Bears. Which I did. Uh, I found a place to spend the night that wasn't free. And it was a death boy. And so I'm in the D.C. Eagle on a Thursday night. And if you've ever been to the D.C. Eagle on a Thursday night back in 94, 93, something like that, uh, you knew that there was nobody there. Okay. And there was nobody there I knew. Uh, anyway, when I get home from my weekend with the Bergenfield Bears, there's a message on my machine from someone in Indianapolis that I knew asking me about the deaf boy that I picked up at the D.C. Eagle on Thursday night, and I was in the D.C. Eagle no more than 45 minutes, and there was not a soul there I knew. That's how small the community <laughs> is <laughs> at that time. Wow. And that I was is connected. Wow. Yes. Wow. Wow. You've mentioned the shop at the, uh, the Ramrod here. Tell us a, a lot more about that, because I think that that's definitive for the whole story here. Oh, well, the, the store is 132 square feet. Um, and the, the guy who owned it, and opened it when the bar first started, um, had AIDS. And again, this was pre-protease inhibitors. Um, and he got to where he wasn't able to work the store at all. And he wasn't much able to make stuff at home uh, to be sold at the store. Um, and he let the guys at the bar know that he needed to give it up. Um, and... My business partner, Eric Lawrence, uh, it's a whole nother set of stories there. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they offered it to him, and he said, sure, if I can get Bear Man to be my partner. So I got home from one of those three-week road trips, and my message machine at home was full. It was about seven or eight messages from people trying to get me to contact Eric Lawrence right away because there was an opportunity to buy the store at the Ramrod Bar. Okay. Okay. Um, and I got home on a Tuesday, I think. And Friday night, Eric and I opened the store. Wow. Um, we bought, we bought the store lock, stock, a barrel, whatever was there we bought. And of course I had some merchandise in my van. Um, and we threw away probably a quarter of what was in the store that we bought because it was shop worn and it had been in the ramrod bar. So it was covered in nicotine and smoke and, um, and we, we took over. No idea what we were doing, but, well, I had a little bit of an idea, and Eric had a little bit of an idea, but really didn't know what we were doing. Um, and interesting thing is, the cash register in that store 
was the cash register that Eric had had 10 years earlier when he owned a hair salon. Okay. And he sold it to somebody else, and it had moved over to um, the uh, Fort Lauderdale Eagle in the store that Ed Byarski had. And when Ed went out of business, that store and that cash register ended up at the Ramrod store, and we got it. Wow, small world. Yes, again, another story of how small the world is. Um, and we, Eric worked part time, and he had a Rolodex. He had the best Rolodex of anybody I knew in Fort Lauderdale. Okay. Um, and this again, this was still pre cell phone era. And uh, it's so so far long ago that we had a rotary dial telephone in, wow. the, in, in the store that we used to call in and get authorizations for credit cards. Oh my! We gosh. didn't have a credit card machine. That's how old it was. Wow! Um, and that's how frugal I am because I had the rotary dial dial telephone. Uh, we got a credit card machine quite promptly. But still, you'd have to call in for authorizations every once in a while. We had a rotary dial phone. God, Eric hated that thing. <laughs> he hated that thing. Um, and I loved it because it was paid for. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, we did that for, like I said, a couple of years. Um, and we realized that we needed a daytime store so we'd have some stability. And Eric never worked full-time in the business. He always worked part-time. He tended to work, he'd work weekends and maybe a couple of hours on a busy night. Um, um, he was a hairdresser during the day. Oh. Um, and, and then we opened, we got the store open and you know, I worked, I worked for the store full-time. Eric would help out and he knew everybody in town when we needed to do something. He knew who to call, um, and in that era, when he was in good health, uh, there were he sponsored a lot, of, a lot of events. Um, he started the leather mask ball with, uh, with his his partner Ira Smith, and the black heart ball. He did a lot of things for the community. He knew everybody to call. And then the store just kind of, um, whenever there was a big event like that, of course, the store would benefit. Uh, and the store was the sponsor for all these events. And then Eric, you know, uh, about 10 years, 10, 12 years ago now, started getting sick. Um, he had, he was a long-term survivor of HIV. Um, and... He died of cancer, so and not one that's related to HIV. It was just a totally different, weird kind of cancer that he was told at the time. It's a good thing we got it when we did. Otherwise, you'd have been dead within a year because this is a terrible cancer. Mm -hmm. And he lived. He lived eight years with it. They didn't get it all, but um, every year or so, when the medication they had for it stopped working, a new one would come along. Wow. And so he lived about he lived with the cancer about eight years, and slowly backed away from the store. So that brings you now to your current circumstances, mm -hmm. and you said it's already outgrown part of the building where you've had to move the production to another location. You also told me that one of the specialties of shopping here is superior customer service. Talk with us about that. Early on, I guess I guess it's been long enough now. Um, Jojo Hughes had a leather shop on Weijin Alley, right around the corner from the dugout, and Jojo was all did some wholesale business, not huge wholesale business, but did some wholesale business. And the first piece of leather I ever bought was a wristband that I bought from the little 
leather kiosk store in the Rochester in the Rochester Ramrod. No. What was it called? It wasn't the Ramrod. I don't remember. The le the, it was Rochester Rams was the leather club. And the bat, no. The I can't, forum? No, it wasn't. No, I can't remember the. Yeah, it was the bachelor <laughs> forum. It was the leather bar in town. And they had a little, at one time, had a little leather counter there. And I bought this wristband that was made by JoJo Hughes' company. Okay. And it was made of. It was had some studs on it, and it was made out of bonded leather. Um, and about a year later, I had to replace it because the leather had started to disintegrate, and the snaps were stain were steel, not stainless steel, and they'd all rusted. And I said, when we started in business, I said, I don't ever want people to remember me because I remembered this was a decade later, maybe more. I don't want people to remember me or my merchandise the way I remember this piece that came from JoJo Hughes. Uh, I'm not going to be the for the price conscious consumer. I'm going to put up quality, and it's all about customer service. Because you know, face it, you can buy lube at Walmart. You can buy lube at Walgreens. Well, here in Fort Lauderdale, you probably can find somebody at Walgreens to help you pick the right lube. <laughs> but, you know, anywhere else in the country, chances are slim you'll get customer service at Walmart buying lube, or at, at uh, Walgreens buying lube, and you definitely won't get it at Walmart. Um, but here at Leatherworks, you've got somebody who's trained to know the difference between the different kinds of lube, and it can help you find the right lube. And we've always um, prided ourselves on quality products and customer service. Um, and when you have a quality product, you don't have to worry near as much about customer service with people bringing something back and saying, this is a piece of crap or it's broken or it's damaged or whatever. Um, that's one of the reasons very, very, very early in our business career, I found out about stainless steel snaps because in a bar store with all the smoke uh, and the nicotine, <coughs> the snaps would get nasty and gray and corroded very, very quickly. Um, and so we discovered stainless steel. I found stainless steel and we switched over. And at the time, a stainless steel, a set of four parts that make a snap was about 10 cents in stainless steel and about two cents in, in plain steel. Well, it's a whole lot more today, but the, the, the spread's still about the same. Um, and um, we switched very quickly. The merchandise we bought had steel snaps in it, and I realized how quickly they were failing in that in that environment, so we switched to stainless steel and solid brass and brass with chrome plating, good quality chrome plate. Um, and then your customer service is finding the making sure that the customer gets the right size. Um, you know, cock rings. Oh my God, we sell hundreds of different cock rings. Well, you got to get the right size. And you know, and there's cock rings for wearing to the to the nude beach, and cock <laughs> rings for wearing to the non-nude beach, and cock rings for wearing to the bar, and cock rings for wearing all day, and cock rings for sex. And people don't realize this. You know, somebody comes in to buy a cock ring. Well, what do you want it for? And a lot of customers are kind of shy about that. So, well, do you want it for going to, for the beach, or for everyday wear, or for yes. sex? Because we got different cock rings, and that's what we're all about. Um, the other, I don't work in the store very much the other day, these days. But the other day, 
they got real busy in the store and I happened to be there and I waited on a customer who was from Indiana or someplace, I don't know, not here. Um, he was going on one of the cruises that was leaving that weekend and we, we visited and he finally says, well, you know, we're here about, we come to Fort Lauderdale on vacation about once a year and we always shop here. And the reason, but the reason we shop here is the customer service. And that just makes me feel good. And I don't want to give away a business secret, but I'm going to. I should charge you for this. Uh, everybody who watches this YouTube video needs to pay for it. Uh, we don't sell stuff here at Leatherworks. You might walk out of here with a bag that has stuff in it. But we didn't sell the stuff. We sold the service. It's not about a, getting a cock ring. It's about getting the right cock ring. It's not about getting a harness. It's about getting the right harness for you that looks good on you, that fits you. Uh, we don't offer our vests for sale online. Oh. Intentionally. Because I want people to come into the store and I want them to be fit for a vest. Um, because I want it to fit right and I want it to look good on them. And if we have to say, you know, your body shape is a little bit uh, outside the, the norm and we need to custom make your vest, uh, if, if you want a good, if you want, really want a good vest that fits you well, we should custom make it. It's going to cost a little more. Yeah. Uh, you know, the vest you've got on is is about as good as you're going to get for off the rack. Um, but we can do better and leave it up to the customer. But he, most people don't know what size they wear. Right. Um, and. You know, and what the hell is small or medium or large or extra large? Or how do you know what that is even? You don't. You guess. So it's all about the service. When you are wanting to hire someone, when you're looking for new staff members for the store, what qualities do you see? Honesty and integrity. Uh personality um, and and we start most of our people part-time um, and if they work out well if they do a good job if they take good care of customers if we get good feedback from them or about them um, then then they can move to full time. Um, we don't start everybody at part time, but we start a lot of people at part time. Um, the general manager of the store started working part time two nights a week at the Ramrod about ten years ago, um, and he now um, is general manager around here, and he helps out with Stomper's boots. He helps out not a lot, but a little bit. And he helps out with Stomper's gloves uh, a bit more, as well as training, training people and filling in for the bookkeeper. If the bookkeeper's out, he does jack of all, he's a jack of all trades. And he started here part-time two nights a week. Okay. Do you have much of a turnover in personnel? Oh, it's the Great Recession. It's the Great Resignation. Uh, we go, prior to the recession, we would which we'd, we'd lose one or two a year, very, very stable. Okay. Uh, and then uh, in 2020, we had to let some people go and cut hours uh, for the rest of them, or most of the rest of the staff. And... Since then, um, we have um, had far more turnover than I would like as we have tried to ramp back up for business. Um, and 
I've never experienced the number of people who, not long ago, we had somebody go to lunch and never come back. Oh, wow. Um, yes, yesterday, um, I had somebody working in, um, run, the guy who, who was running our sewing shop uh, came in and I was busy with another project and uh, didn't even notice he was here at first because I was so preoccupied with what I was doing. And then I realized he was here um, and we finished up the other project and he walked over and he threw his keys on the counter in front of me and said, I quit. It's been great. Goodbye. My gosh. Um, okay. And... <clears throat> tried to find out what that was all about, he wasn't even, even going to talk. Um, so, and we had, we had a couple of guys last week, week before, um, one was out sick for a week, and he came in, and uh, there was some problems while he was out, talk to him he quit wow. uh, and one of his good friends that worked with us had been out at the same time he never came back so uh, we just have a lot we've had a lot more turnover we go through this from time to time when you have turnover sometimes you go through a couple of people before you get stabilized. I remember we're a drug-free workplace now. Um, and it was probably five or six years ago. We had five new hires in a row with crystal meth issues. And that's when we, I had for years said what people do on their own time is their own, time, is their own stuff. Um, but the reality is what you do on your own time comes to work with you every day. Um, and so uh, we instituted, we, we, do, uh, we do drug testing of all new hires, and we do occasional random testing, okay. and we do uh, testing when we have reasonable, reasonable cause. Okay. Um, and most of the time when we have reasonable cause, uh, the people don't even take the test. They just say, I can't pass it. And they're gone. Wow. And our, our, health, or our workers' comp insurance company gives us a 5% discount on our premium because we're a drug-free workplace. That's a state of Florida program. Wow. Wow. So, uh, I hate Crystal. The board of the uh, Leather Archives and Museum. Mm -hmm. What was your involvement? Uh, well, the I knew um, um, Joseph Bean from his years at. Drum, or drummer Magazine and American Leatherman. And, um, he was the uh, executive director of the archives at the time that they found the new building. Yes. And Tony DeBloss had been very much involved with the founding of the, the Leather Archives along with Joanne Gaddy. And, uh, uh, and Bill Costamaris had been a bit involved. He was from North Carolina, part of the Tar Heels, and uh, ran the Southeast Leather Contest or something. Um, and anyway, we were at we were at IML, and I was went to Bill Bill Costamaris and Tony were sharing a hotel room, and I went to their room one night after the vendor market closed, and out came the bourbon and <laughs> the conversation about. Uh, we had just located a building that was going to be perfect for the leather archives. 
and somehow they needed to come up with money for a down payment. Yes. And my, uh, there had been enough bourbon at that point in time that I, my mouth wrote a check that I had to cash. Uh, I said, I'll give you $1,500, which I had no idea where that money was coming from, I, uh, towards this down payment. And you go around the vendor market tomorrow and you talk to every vendor and say, Bear Man has pledged $1,500 towards um, this down payment. Um, and it turned out they managed to get eight or ten people to pledge, match my pledge. Um, and that night at the contest, um, my my hangover was gone by then. <laughs> um, and uh, they started talking about this new building, and they drug the, the ten of us out on the stage that had, had pledged money and. That's when they passed the hat, um, and that's how I started my uh, involvement with Leather Archives. And then the next year, Michael Horowitz from New York um, was on the board of the Archives, and he came up to me in the vendor market and said, congratulations. And I said, for what? Said, well, you've been elected to the board of the Leather Archives. Oh, I didn't know a thing about this. Um, and that's how loosey-goosey the Leather Archives was at that time before they, <laughs> when they had a little storefront on Clark Street and a bunch of stuff in Chuck's basement. Um, and I said, okay. And we had our first board meeting. Um, and I said, you know, we really have to have an institution here. And I was involved for nearly 20 years with the Leather Archives. Um, and uh, spent about eight of those, eight or 10 of those years as the treasurer. Um, and helped create the institution, uh, the framework for an institution so that no one ever got told, oh, congratulations. Um, that people were vetted before they were elected to the board and talked to, and uh, so and I'm quite proud of what happened with the Leather Archives. We, uh, in that 20 years I was involved, we went from Chuck, who paid most of the bills out of his own pocket, um, to um, a freestanding institution. Why did you leave? So, uh, you know, we when we bought Stomper's gloves, um, all of a sudden, I had my hands really, really full. And I'd been on the board for the lion's share of 20 years. And it was just, I couldn't give it the attention it deserved. Um, and I had managed to recruit a couple of good people to the board. Um, and knew that the archives would be in good hands without me. What's the biggest misconception about you? I don't know. I don't know if there are any. Okay. Uh, depends on who you talk to. You will find people who will say that I'm a real mensch. And you'll find people who say, I'm a great businessman. And you'll find people who say that I'm a son of a bitch. And they're all right. Mm. Okay? They're all right. Um, so, I don't know that there are any misconceptions. Um, because there are times when I can be a real challenge. And there's times when I'm a, a, a great guy, but don't screw with me. Bearman, thank you very much for an amazing interview for Inside Leather History, a fireside chat. Thank you. Thank you.